So welcome everyone. It's great to see you here. We had a nice sunny spring day. Our visitor from Ann Arbor had snow. Yeah. So welcome. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to have you at the inaugural Chancellor's Distinguished Lecture. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take maybe three minutes or so to set the stage, why we are doing what we are doing, how is it framed. So a great American innovation, in my opinion, across all sectors, is the land-grant university, of which New Brunswick is one, as you know. Over the last 150 years or so that the land grants have survived, it's about 156 years, I think, these universities have made higher education possible to the working class, to segments of the society that hitherto had been excluded. And in unlocking this vast human potential, it did wonders for the country. It made the Industrial Revolution possible through advanced agricultural methods. It gave us abundance of food and so many other things. Since then, through public investments in higher education, in the land-grant institutions as well as others, our nation has built a strong and resilient economy, improved the health and well-being of its people, and sustained a democratic process. So fast forward to the 21st century, knowledge economy, and one might think that research universities like ours have built in respect, to be sure, with high expectations from the public. That is because research universities not only prepare the future workforce, they actually prepare minds. It is here that the next generation of leaders read the great books, learn history, learn to think critically, appreciate the arts and the humanities, whether for its own good or in the context of a profession. So institutions of higher ed and public institutions in particular, it's making these making the case to the public that these goals are aligned with the public good and therefore worth sustained investments is becoming increasingly difficult. Across the nation, higher education share of statewide spending continues to decline. More worrisome, I would say, is a recent Pew, a Pew Research Center poll in which it was reported only 55% of Americans believe that colleges and universities have a positive effect on the nation. Only 55%. Why so? What are its implications? As a research university, as a New Brunswick community, we need to be thinking about that. Now, if you think that this lecture series is a griping session. It is not. It is not. Quite the contrary. I'm making the argument that even with declining state support, we have much work to do and we will do it. The pace of change in the world is unrelenting. It's accelerating. Rapidly evolving technology, a growing population, changing demographics, impacts of human and their lifestyle on the planet Earth. These will pose great challenges, not only to institutions like ours, but to the society at large. Therefore, this Chancellor's Distinguished Lecture Series in 2018 will focus on American higher education and what it must do in the future to confront these changes. We have opportunities and challenges ahead of us. We will see, we will discuss collectively, and I'm now referring to the, the audience here for New Brunswick, as I've been doing through campus conversations and so forth. This is a conversation we need to have. 
not only in these big town halls, in faculty meetings, in, in schools, and so forth. I'd like the campus to be fully engaged in this kind of conversation because it impacts us, it impacts the society, it impacts the state. So it's imperative that these conversations be inclusive and forward thinking. We will focus on public research universities. We've got to frame the problem. Higher education is a fairly broad sector and the speakers who will come in this series will be talking about public research universities like Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Each of them will focus and highlight different facts, different issues, but they are all interconnected. No matter which way you look at it, you will see by the end of it, they are all interconnected. They impact the university and what we do going forward. Finally, I would say that I believe public research universities can and will step up to the challenges and in service of the people. So that is what this lecture series is all about. Now it is my pleasure, a distinct pleasure, to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dr. James J. Durstadt. He is the President Emeritus and University Professor of Science and Engineering at the University of Michigan. He received a Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical Engineering with highest honors from Yale University and an MS and PhD in Engineering Science and Physics from Caltech. After a year as a postdoc, Dr. Durstadt joined the faculty of the University of Michigan in the Department of Nuclear Engineering, rising through the ranks to full professor in 1975. He became the Dean of the College of Engineering in 1981, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs in 1986, and was elected the President of University of Michigan in 1988. He was in that role until 1996. His teaching and research have spanned a wide range of subjects in science, mathematics, engineering, information technology, and in public policy. He has published extensively in these areas, including over 30 books and 200 technical publications. During his career, Dr. Durstadt has received numerous awards and honorary degrees. Let me just list a few. He received the E.O. Lawrence Award for Excellence in Nuclear Research. He received the Arthur Hawley Compton Prize for Outstanding Teaching, the U.S. National Medal of Technology for Exemplary Service to the Nation, Vannevar Bush Award for Lifelong Contributions to the Welfare of the Nation through Public Service, Activities in Science, Technology, and Public Policy. And just last month, he received the John Hope Franklin Award from Diverse for his demonstrated an unwavering commitment to increasing the number of underrepresented students and faculty when he was the president of the University of Michigan. He was widely hailed by that committee for setting the diversity precedent amongst predominantly white institutions within the US. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In addition, the University of Michigan's major building from, for technological innovation and research was named James and Ann Durstadt Center in 2004. It is affectionately referred to as the Dude. Dr. Durstadt has served and chaired many public and private boards, including the National Science Board, the Executive Council of the National Academy of Engineering, the Nuclear Engineering Advisory Committee of the Department of Energy, Intelligence Science Board, and as a director of business organizations such as UNISYS, CMS Energy, University of Michigan Hospital, and the Big Ten Athletic Conference. I want to share with you just a personal thing. Um, so yesterday for most of you, you probably know that our Board of Governors met uh, and that was uh, the meeting in which 
the promotions and tenure were approved, at least the first round. It's a big thing. So I was um, in the meeting and I heard uh, the presentation and I couldn't but help reflect back on my own promotion and tenure long years ago. And I was thinking that because I was going to welcome Jim Durstadt here. So he was the president then and um, I got tenure, 1995. And then what happened, after a few days, maybe weeks, I got this book. This book and the envelope said, Office of the President. Well, that's nice. Um, the University of Michigan, it has beautiful pictures of the campus. And then I opened the book, and this is what I want you to see. On the left-hand side, it says, to Devashish and Fatane, my wife, She's here in the audience. So congratulations and thanks for helping to make Michigan such a special place. Jim and Ann Dudestad. I had never met Jim Dudestad until then. <laughs> but this was such a special thing for me. I, this is the first time I'm saying it in front of him. Um, University of Michigan, big place, so many people get promoted and tenured, that the president of the university would send this book to me and handwrite a note in there. I'm not going to ask if he did it for everyone. I'm going to say he did it for just a few of us. <laughs> Jim, please, please. Uh, but this was special. And um, so, so what happened when I became the provost at Purdue? The first year when all the promotions happened, I remembered this and to all the 98 faculty members who got tenure and promotion, I wrote my cards, handwritten each and every one of them. And it was a great joy because I read the dossier anyway. But, and then we had an event recognizing them. And at that event when I was speaking, I referred to this event in my life. I didn't take any credit for it. I said, I was the recipient of something like this. It was very special to me, so I hope it is special to you. And the faculty appreciated like crazy. This was so good, and I kept doing it. So for those of you in this room who are getting promoted and so forth, now you know, when you get my letter, this is the reason. I don't take any credit. I have been, um, so Jim and I got to know each other when I was at National Science Foundation. And since then, we've kept in touch. I consider him a mentor of, of many kinds. Um, talk to him very frequently. A man of great intellect. And so it is my great pleasure and honor, Jim, to invite you to give this inaugural lecture. Please help me welcome. <laughs> I'll come over there. Well, it's been a rough several weeks. Final four, <laughs> the frozen four. Uh, I must add that during my years as president, five Rose Bowls, Three final fours, three frozen fours, and a record against Ohio State of eight, one, and one. <laughs> there. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try and do like he did and stand up at this thing. This is kind of a, the uh, same class I would face yet last, last night, actually, in, in, in Ann Arbor, uh, if I can read. But you, as you see, my, my notes are so screwed up anyway, <laughs> even if I can't read. Uh, as a uh, graduate of the Connecticut School, uh, visiting another uh, one of the colonial schools in Queens College means a lot to me. 
the institution I'm at right now is a, a relative youngster. We followed uh, Rutgers University by about 50 years, but last year we had our uh, bicentennial. And uh, like Rutgers and like Yale, uh, we became the University of Michigan before there was a state of Michigan. We were actually created by the Northwest Territory, by an act of the federal government. Uh, a situation we try to explain to our Board of Regents from time to time. Uh, like Rutgers University, which I will define for you for these remarks as Rutgers New Brunswick, uh, and I will define the University of Michigan as Michigan Ann Arbor, because both of these represent national and indeed world leading research universities in our respective states. We have satellite campuses that are extremely valuable, but I'm going to focus on flagship institutions like Michigan and Rutgers. Uh, they have a long history, both have a long history of leadership. Uh, they are now part of what we used to call the Big Ten. Uh, I guess it's Big 14, and if you look at the symbol for the Big Ten, B-I, something that looks like a G but more like a six, I think you have the dream of Jim Delaney, commissioner of the Big Ten. There are two more to go. Um, furthermore, uh, back to the question just for a second, uh, you have the advantage of having two of your campuses led by chancellors from Michigan. Uh, we're at a loss in that case because we don't have anybody at Michigan from Michigan right now in our leadership role in our campuses. Uh, both of our challenges, our institutions face the same challenges today. And I'll say a little bit about that but I want to kind of move into the future a bit. Uh, for the last 20 years, I've been a co-director of what's called the Gleon Colloquium. This is a Davos-like organization bringing presidents from around the world to a wonderful old hotel in, uh, in Switzerland overlooking Lake Geneva uh, to talk about things involving higher education from a global perspective. Uh, before each meeting, we give all the presidents an assignment. Uh, we'd like you to write a paper on this issue and then we'll discuss it, and then after that, we'll give you a chance to revise your paper, and then we'll publish a book on it, which are all on the website and you can download. Uh, at this particular session last year, that topic was to imagine what society will look like 20 years from now, and then to describe how your university must prepare itself to move toward that vision. And since we had universities from Europe, from Asia, from Latin America, uh, from Africa uh, and from the United States, you can imagine that we got a rather large spirit, uh, set of, of recommendations and, and visions. I'll move to that in just a second. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about that, but to kind of stir up some discussion and maybe questions, I promised uh, your chancellor that at the end I will throw in a few zingers. Um, how UM, University of Michigan gets by with only 4% of its budget from the state of Michigan. Uh, we are a publicly committed uh, but privately financed institution. That's a term Frank Rhodes used to use at Cornell University. Second, how, what is our culture? Our culture is as a rainforest. I was trying to explain that to some of your faculty over the afternoon, and I'll, I'll, do, and I'll also add the three rules I always tell young faculty of how to get things done around in Michigan, which always drives our administration nuts. And then finally, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how to handle Jim Delaney and the Big Ten from personal experience. Um, challenges of today, well, I think uh, your chancellor put it well. Um, the key assets driving prosperity and intellectual capital uh, have become knowledge and, and education. Uh, they essentially have created this global economy. Uh, we see a rapidly changing nature of our population in many societies as their populations age. But the United States is different. Uh, this nation was built as a nation of immigrants, and today it remains a nation of immigrants. In fact, over the last decade, we've had more population growth in this country from immigration than we've had from childbirth. That, of course, I think makes the United States a very energetic and inspired nation, uh, despite what you sometimes hear from Washington. Uh, but other things have happened. Uh, despite the fact of public funding that has created uh, many of our institutions, over the last decade, that has declined very significantly. 
uh, for research universities, public research universities like Rutgers and, and Michigan has dropped about 35 to 40 percent. In a sense, our nation is beginning to view things like education as essentially a private benefit rather than a public good, and that needs to be challenged. Um, and then finally, as uh, your chancellor pointed out, America's confidence in these institutions seems to be eroding a bit. Uh, a significant fraction no longer understand their importance. Well, that's the world of today. What about the world of 2030 and 2040? Well, population will continue to increase in our world um, to perhaps uh, eight and a half billion by 2030, uh, 10 billion, 2050, and so forth, but not in the developed economies, in England, I mean, in Europe, uh, in Asia, uh, and in, in uh, other parts, uh, with the exception of the United States, again, if we recognize how important immigration is. In sharp contrast, in developing nations in Asia, Latin America, and particularly in Africa, you'll see enormous growth. The population of Africa is expected to double over the next several decades. That's going to create a large population of billions of people uh, who will, without the effort of our developed nations, be denied the education necessary to compete in and survive in this world that's driven by knowledge. Uh, another demographic factor, uh, the progress of biomedical sciences means that today's millennials, that are graduating from our colleges and, and universities, will live into their 90s, and a child born, it's estimated, will live into their hundreds. Now think for a moment what that implies for our retirement systems. There is no way in the world that people are going to be able to retire at 70, perhaps at 80. They're going to have to continue to work far beyond where they work right now, which means that the education they received when they're 20 is not going to work very well when they're in their 80s and 90s. Uh, that suggests that, in fact, uh, we're going to have to somehow figure out a way to provide educational resources to them throughout their lives. Longer lives will require more years of work, and therefore the, re the education received in one's youth is not enough. Somehow these institutions have to be restructured to really take lifelong learning seriously. Second topic, technology. Well, it demonstrates my age, reveals it rather, but I was born the same year that ENIAC, uh, the first digital computer, was turned on. It had the processing power of a Christmas card, you know, that plays jingle bells. We have 10% of it, huge things sitting in a glass case on one of our buildings. Uh, during my first years, I worked on supercomputers at national labs like Los Alamos and, and Livermore. And for the last couple of years, I've chaired a major Department of Energy uh, project that this summer is installing the Summit supercomputer will be the fastest computer in the world. From ENIAC to Summit, this technology and all of the things associated with it has been evolving at the rate of 100 to 1,000 fold a decade. Uh, in fact, the computer we're installing in, uh, uh, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory this summer uh, can process 260 times 10 to the 15th arithmetic operations a second. But as a result of that, all kinds of things have begun to appear that we've, we, we've never expected. Social media, virtual and augmented reality, intelligent agents, how many of you talk to Siri and Alexa? Uh, they listen to you, I can assure you that. Uh, these strange organizations have developed. Uh, Google, uh, with the, the objective of making all of the world's knowledge available to all of the world's people. Facebook, to connect all the people of the world, and of course, as we found out over the last several weeks, digest their information and sell it to people. And Amazon, the everywhere, uh, everything store. These technologies have a definite impact on our life, but they also threaten us in ways that we hadn't first imagined. Uh, there's a, the, uh, in Europe, they call it the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, in which more routine jobs in areas like construction, manufacturing, and services may gradually begin to disappear, uh, taken over by automation. In fact, some estimate that in the near future, perhaps only 20% of today's jobs will continue to be uh, available. And the real challenge is how to create meaningful lives in a world with rapidly increasing machine intelligence. Uh, in a sense, 
uh, if we do not evolve rapidly our education system, they will, these, our citizens will not have the skills for these new jobs. Third topic, uh, creativity, communication, and convergence. The professions that dominate, dominated the 20th century were ones that kind of manipulated and rearranged existing knowledge. But the professions of today and the economy of today is built on creating new things. Uh, we can create new objects atom by atom with so-called CRISPR-Cas9 <coughs> genetic editing and gene drive, we can not only precisely modify DNA, but we could actually modify the code for living organisms and propagate that, frighteningly enough. As I said earlier, the dramatic evolution of information technology shows no sign of slowing down, and in fact, traditional tools of, like big data and artificial intelligence are rapidly progressing. We're seeing new kinds of, of, of organizations evolve, maker, maker uh, fairs, uh, additive manufacturing, and so forth. In fact, some people are looking at this create, span of creativity, suggesting that maybe we're due for some kind of a renaissance, where the tools for doing new things and creating things will become so powerful. Uh, perhaps the determining characteristic of the university 21st century will be a shift in intellectual, intellectual focus, away from studying what is or what has been to creating what can only be imagined. But there's a great challenge here, uh, <clears throat> that is, how do we create programs that do that? <clears throat> Back to Michigan for a second. Uh, on the campus on which our engineering school exists, we have three other schools, architecture, art, and music. All prize the intellectual activity of creativity. And so the question is how to get all of these groups together so that artists and architects and musicians and engineers can all explore creativity and move ahead. A number of years ago, uh, I was able to talk our governor of Michigan out of $70 million to build what we called the Media Union, a 260,000 square foot uh, facility running seven days a week, 24 hours a day, year round, where all of these people could come, which they do. Uh, the only problem with that, it, it, uh, in 2004, they decided to name, after, name it after me and my wife, so the students refer to it only as the dude. I will meet you at the dude at midnight to create something. Um, another change, uh, convergence. Uh, if you look at the fields like medicine and so forth, which at one time were very much biological sciences, today they're, f they're, they're influenced more by things like physics, uh, by mathematics, uh, by computer science and so forth. All of these disciplines are beginning to converge. Uh, what's called consilience by E.O. Wilson. And that will again challenge the university to break down disciplinary barriers and pull people together. Uh, the fourth issue, social and political change. Well, we live in a world in which, the, even as we become more dependent on technology, the very technology that we create is key to, that's key to creating and archiving and making available knowledge is ironically being used to attack us. In the Trump era, social media has become not only a powerful tool of American politics, but it has the power to distort knowledge, alt-truth, fake news. Um, it can actually almost create powerful, almost mythological forces that we've seen over the last couple of years. Uh, it creates a new spirit of xenophobic and racist energy that creates a hostile electorate. Uh, parents and young people are beginning to question the value of higher education. Indeed, one wealthy billionaire is even trying to bribe students not to go to college, as you may have heard of a year or so ago. Uh, policymakers uh, determined to serve populist constituencies are kind of erecting barriers to higher education. It's almost threatening to them. Uh, and so two decades into our new century, there are unmistakable signs that America's famed social mobility may be in trouble. Well, there are a lot of broader challenges beyond this over a two or three decade uh, timetable. Uh, certainly compelling evidence that our growing population and invasive activities of humankind are challenging the fragile balance of our planet. Destruction of forests, natural habitats, extinction of millions of, of species, um, and in fact, uh, the impact on the global climate. Uh, incidentally, I have a, a, a daughter that's an atmospheric scientist at the University of New Hampshire. 
and she has been funded by the National Science Foundation to do a series of uh, seminars over the course of this year on what the melting of the polar ice cap will mean to New England. Uh, interesting topic. Uh, the first thing they found was and concluded was that the principal shipping port to Asia will become Boston. You'll go up and over rather than down and through the Panama Canal. Even Maine may get a new economy if that happens. Other things that might happen, um, there are widening gaps in prosperity, health, and quality. Uh, are there possibilities of, uh, of very serious things? Uh, perhaps uh, <clears throat> new paradigms, uh, such as an avian flu virus that will ravage our species. The divide between rich and poor may become more and more serious, driving even more social unrest. Technology itself could present new challenges. Uh, some scientists have a term they call technological singularity when technology gets out of control. And I suppose if, hu if uh, machines begin to develop consciousness, uh, that might happen. Another antidote, uh, I was talking to a, a young uh, pediatric uh, anesthesiologist a couple of weeks ago, and I asked, what do you look at medical practice as being in 10 or 20 years? And he said, well, for me, the first thing I will do is explain to my patient what Watson diagnosed their illness as. Watson's the IBM artificial intelligence. Then the second thing I'll, uh, that I will have to explain is what the robot surgeon will do to cure that problem. Future of medicine? I don't know. Other things, uh, machine consciousness, contact by extraterrestrial intelligence, cosmic extinction from a wandering asteroid. Well, they're all of these things. We can't predict them. But we have to make sure our descendants are equipped with the education skills to, uh, de to deal with them. Uh, I think the key in this is for leaders of higher education and those uh, that contribute and commit themselves to their institutions to engage in a much more strategic process, not necessarily deciding immediately this is where we have to go, but rather than that, conducting an ongoing discussion of what these futures might be and how they affect it. I can tell you that the actual plans for moving and dealing with these issues laid out by the various presidents differed enormously, and for the most part, they only agreed on the fact that they were probably totally inadequate for this kind of a future. But nevertheless, it began to establish them. Well, what can we imagine in the case for institutions like these in the future? I think it's, it's probably the case universities will continue to exist as a place, at least for the near term. Uh, as digital technology makes it increasingly possible to emulate human interaction at all, at all senses with arbitrary high fidelity, we probably shouldn't bind teaching and scholarship too tightly to buildings and grounds, but probably still to place. Learning and scholarship are based on communities. Uh, these communities are becoming already increasingly global in extent, uh, detached from the constraints of space and time. Uh, but for the longer term, some technologies that really do evolve at a hundred to a thousand fold a decade will create uh, very new challenges. Um, it might even be possible that anyone with a modest internet or cellular phone connection will have uh, access to all of the recorded knowledge of our civilization. Uh, let me come back to Michigan and I'll give you a, three data points that kind of point in this direction. Uh, <clears throat> data point number one, during the uh, 1980s, uh, it was our thought to try and put in a proposal to win from the National Science Foundation a grant to build a giant, to buy a gigantic supercomputer. The only problem was that the computer we wanted to buy was a Fujitsu computer, and NSF wasn't very interested in buying computers from Japan. So at the time, we had a new chief information officer. Uh, we recruited from Carnegie Mellon, Douglas Van Halen, and he said, let's go after another National Science Foundation grant. They want to build a network that will connect all of their scientists to these computers that they're building around the country. Well, Michigan had had some experience in building a uh, network called Merit, and so Van Halen enlisted the partnership of, MB of IBM and MCI uh, we built such a network for NSF and found to our surprise the scientists didn't want to talk to computers, they wanted to talk to each other. And so the growth in that network uh, was about 10 to 15 percent in usage a month. We were able with the technology that we were using to achieve that. 
it was successful enough, other government networks were folded in. They began to call it the internetwork, and then they finally just called it the internet, which we managed uh, by setting up a not-for-profit, Advanced Network Services, until 1973. And at that point, uh, the World Wide Web came along, industry woke up, and we spun it off. Uh, that's the internet. Uh, uh, it came off of campuses. Uh, what about Google? Well, we didn't create Google, but we educated uh, 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 its uh, founder, uh, Larry Page, uh, at Michigan. And finally, Page came back uh, in the uh, uh, 2003, 2004 and said, uh, we'd like to digitize all of the books in the Michigan Library. At that point, we had about four or five million, and we said, that's hundreds of millions of dollars. He said, no, it didn't. We'll build a secret scanning operation in South Ann Arbor. We'll do it with Stanford and with uh, Oxford and Harvard and New York Public Library and see what we come out with. Well, after several years of doing that, Google kind of, or rather, uh, Google got tired of it. And so <clears throat> the universities themselves stepped in and created something called the Hathi Trust. Hathi in Hindi means elephant, memory. Uh, I checked last week. And that now has 17 million digitized volumes available, for the most part, around the world. We get sued every once in a while, but we won most of the sues. And that's the case of libraries disappearing into the cloud. So you can see some of the implications for this. I'll finally conclude this part of my comments <coughs> with a quote that came from an earlier Gleon declaration. Uh, that was given, that I attribute to Frank Rhodes, who was president of Cornell University uh, years ago. For a thousand years, the university has benefited our civilization as a learning community where both the young and the experienced could acquire not only knowledge and skills, but also the values and discipline of the educated mind. It has defended and propagated our cultural and intellectual heritage while challenging our norms and beliefs. The university of the 21st century may be as different from today's institutions as the research university is from the colonial college, but its form and its continued evolution will be a consequence of transformations necessary to provide its ancient values and contributions to a changing society and a changing world. Okay, now. <coughs> ah, after some lubrication into the zingers. <clears throat> How does a very large university, like the University of Michigan, evolve during the five decades I've spent from being a state-supported <clears throat> to a state-assisted, to a state-related, to a state-located university? And actually, since 95% of our support now comes from outside the state, we're not really a state university at all. We're something else. We got in trouble with our Board of Regents for saying that incidentally, but it's true. <clears throat> Well, some things were obvious. Uh, we had to get much more involved in begging for dollars. Uh, we've just concluded a four and a half billion dollar uh, fundraising uh, effort. I, I launched, when I was president, the first billion dollar plus campaign for a university, a public university. But the difficulty with that is that people, while being very generous and committed to the university, usually give for things they want and not the things university needs. That's, for example, why we end up now with an Olympic uh, athletic complex with not only rowing tanks, but some, while wow, underwater exercise machines. I can't understand that at all. Okay. The second thing we can do. <coughs> we can recruit out-of-state students. Uh, Michigan gets about 60,000 applications for admission every year. Uh, <clears throat> we will admit it that we're a safety school. <laughs> a lot of students that would love to go to Yale or Harvard, uh, since those institutions accept only 5% of their applicants, end up in Ann Arbor. Uh, and they pay, essentially, Ivy League tuition, uh, room and board. Uh, but to put that the right way, uh, in a sense, we estimate that it costs about $30,000 across the entire university per year to educate a Michigan student. Uh, without much state support, uh, our undergraduates are paying $15,000 if they're from Michigan in tuition, maybe another $5,000 from the state. So we lose about $10,000 Michigan undergraduate we enroll. 
but we charge Ivy League costs, uh, prices, 60,000, 65,000 this year actually. So we make about 20, 25,000 for every out-of-state student we enroll. Half of that goes into providing the commitment to Michigan undergraduates that no Michigan undergraduate will ever have to drop out of the university for financial reasons. We meet their financial aid. And that's how we explain to the state why we admit so many students from out of state. So if you pose it right, out of state students can, can provide a good deal of momentum. And in fact, we take in about 1.4 million, 1.4 billion a year in tuition at, at Michigan. Uh, third, uh, a bad phrase at Rutgers, RCM, Responsibility Center Management, okay? Uh, back in the uh, uh, 1980s, uh, when I was provost, uh, a provost from the University of Pennsylvania, who, where it, this had been developed, brought it to Indiana. We looked at it, thought that might be an interesting idea, put it in place, but in addition, we put it in place by making all of the deans of the university really the focal point for this activity. Uh, in a very real sense today, Michigan is a dean's institution. They're the ones that raise most of our resources. They beg for dollars from donors. Uh, they attract students that pay tuition. They encourage their faculty to get research grants. Uh, and they generate about 95% of our, of our academic budget. Uh, the other side of it is the president and the regents only control about 5% of that, but that's another part of it. Uh, to handle that, there are two elements. Uh, element number one, uh, since the University of Michigan was created before the state appeared, uh, when the first pioneers began to write the first constitution, they were very suspicious of formal government. And so in that constitution, they included a clause that gave the University of Michigan total constitutional autonomy. That means, in a sense, the state can decide what to give us, but they can't tell us how to spend a penny of it. If we wanted to admit 100% of our students from New Jersey, that will scare you. They couldn't challenge that. And over the years, we have actually sued them from time to time. When I was president, I was persuaded we should extend, extend uh, staff benefits to same-sex couples. Uh, the governor wanted to fire me. Couldn't do it. Okay, sounds like the White House, doesn't it? Anyway, <laughs> anyway that, that's the first part. The second part is our structure. <clears throat> this kind of a system creates in a university kind of a, a, uh, an organic environment, uh, an ecosystem. I, I, I suggest it might be thought of as a rainforest, where it's very complex, but all of the, the excellence, the excitement, the energy come up through the roots from students, from faculty, from uh, staff. At the top of the rainforest, you see leaves and branches. That's the administration. They fall off from time to time, and no one really notices them. But the, the energy comes from below. Um, rainforests are also very good about um, uh, uh, repelling invasive species. An example, uh, three or four years ago, we had a new uh, athletic director actually came off our Board of Regents. He had been the uh, uh, CEO of Domino's Pizza before he came to Michigan. And he launched his uh, uh, new agenda by saying, my, my motto is, if it ain't broken, I'm going to break it. He lasted three years. And then he went to Toys R Us. <laughs> anyway, okay. So, so that's Michigan. And what do I tell entering faculty? Well, to get things done around Michigan, there are three rules. Real rule number one. Never accept no for an answer. If you ask enough, you'll find someone sooner or later that'll say yes. They may not know why they say it, but they'll say yes. Second, the most important play in the Michigan playbook is the end run, okay? If your department chair won't give you what you want, go to the dean, go to the provost, go to the chair, go to the state legislature. <laughs> we do all those things at Michigan. Drives people crazy. And finally, rule three, it's far more effective to seek forgiveness than to ask permission at Michigan. So such is life. Finally, big time athletics. <laughs> oh well, is it Big 10, Big 14, or Big 16? Um, my current assignment from, of all people, all organizations, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, 
is to draft a proposal to the Carnegie Foundation to redo a study they did in 1928 on the corruption of college sports, okay? Because the National Academy would like to take this on. The preamble, the real issue, is why we allow our universities and their organizations, such as athletic conferences and the NCAA, to run a big-time entertainment industry that threatens both the health and educational opportunities of students in order to make a very small number of people very wealthy. Coaches, athletic directors, conference chairs, NCAA executives, entertainment ex executives. What we're really interested in is not a highly detailed analysis but rather an assessment of the impact of the commercialized sports industry on this nation's students and therefore on this nation's universities. Well, I have three weeks to get this proposal together and take it to the uh, Carnegie Foundation. Uh, I dread the thought that I might have to chair the doggone thing. But nevertheless, that's kind of a sign of what old ex-presidents are asked to do from time to time. So, we've got time for a few questions. I've covered a lot of territory.